Hello, I'm Noel Kingsbury, and in this blog post, I'm going to be running through uh, some of the issues about plant names and the definition of plant species and cultivars that sometimes cause confusion amongst students. Um, this is quite a complicated business, but it's very important that uh, we get names right and that we all agree uh, what things are in uh, the plant business. Uh, there's nothing worse than selling plants or buying plants that turn out to be wrongly named. We deal with what are commonly called Latin names, uh, which is a precise and scientific way of describing plants. Uh, we've got an example here, uh, viola, the violet, genus, big genus, probably several hundred of them I think, three examples here, all with their two names, they're binomials, which is the correct technical word for this system of genus and species, always written in the italic script. Latin names is what we usually call them, but in fact it's a bit inaccurate because many of these names are in fact are derived from Greek or indeed other languages. Scientific names is perhaps a little bit more accurate. And we use these because common names can be very confusing, as the example of bluebells, which can mean one, any one of five completely unrelated plants in different countries. However, these scientific names do sometimes change, which causes a great deal of aggravation amongst gardeners. Uh, one that's been upset a few people a few years ago was over two genera, Actea, which is a low growing woodland plant with these brightly colored berries, and Simitifugia, which is clearly related, but has these very, very tall, elegant flower spikes, very useful for late summer uh, autumn uh, flower in, 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 in shade. Um, so why Simisipugias, now Acteas? Well, a British botanist uh, sometime, I think in the 1980s, Jamie Compton did a thesis on these and looking at some very, very detailed microscopic aspects of the plants concluded that there really wasn't enough justification for having them in separate genera. Now because Actea was defined and classified first that took priority so all the semisifugias had to become Acteas and um, we're slowly getting used to it. What's really going to set the cat amongst the pigeons though is Perovskia atriplicifolia, that very special summer flowering, really, really tough drought tolerant plant from Central Asia, Russian sage that does so well in, in so many gardens, is now to be classified apparently as Salvia yangii. So it looks a bit as if a Chinese botanist has been at work here. Um, now, uh, yes, it's shorter and it's uh, perhaps easier to remember. Uh, salvia is a very big genus that was defined a very long time ago and although all the plants are related they don't necessarily have a common ancestor and the way that the classification of living things works these days is on the, with the principle of phylogenetics which means that if everything goes into one group that group has got to have a common ancestor. And it's all about making a system of classification and naming actually reflect what we know about evolution. And the crucial thing here is DNA analysis, which enables us to make a much better determination of what is related to what and what the common ancestors are. Now, salvia as a genus, pretty unwieldy, spread all over the world, that's gonna get split up pretty soon. But it's also going to have some new members, as we find that Perovskia and Rosemary, Rosemarinus officinalis, have enough in common with the core group of Eurasian salvias to be included as salvias. So that rosemary in your herb bed is actually another sage. And here's an example of one of the scientific papers in the Turkish Journal of Botany that is beginning this very major task of reclassifying this made this big and quite important genus. And all these wonderfully colourful uh, American salvias, they're almost certainly going to end up in uh, some other new genus. Now, another one that has caused quite a bit of upset in the horticultural community was Aster. Daisy family, big genus all over the world, uh, rather unwieldy. Uh, DNA analysis made it apparent that it had to be split up to make sense. Uh, so all the American ones have gone off into new genera. So Eurybia, a bit hard to spell, 
not so easy to remember. Um, a bit annoying, but even more annoying was that most of the American asters, such as the New England aster, aster, no, the Anglii, have become symphiotricum, which I am not 100% sure yet whether I actually can remember how to spell it. I mean, okay, this has to be done perhaps, but the botanists who do this, I do wish they would just pay a little bit more thought to how people outside their closeted world will actually uh, deal with remembering and spelling the names they think up. Now, we go back to Perovskia atroplisifolia. Oops, sorry. Salvia yangii. Um, we come across a certain number that are sold in nurseries, for example, with the scientific name, and then in ordinary type, and inverted commas, another name, in this case, blue spire. Now, blue spire is a cultivar, and the vast majority of plants we deal with in commercial horticulture are cultivars. Uh, they may be the result of planned breeding, they may be just a chance discovery. And with those commercially important genera, roses and orchids and irises and tulips and daffodils, it's nearly all cultivars that we're dealing with. Uh, to take an example, geranium firm, a very variable, very useful perennial from Central Europe. Great garden plant for early summer. With these mysterious murky maroony colored flowers. Uh, Lily Lovell was picked out. Um, uh, for having bigger flowers, more colourful flowers on a more upright, vigorous plant, a very good cultivar. So every plant of Lily Lovell you buy should be exactly the same because the key thing about cultivars is that the individuals of the cultivar should be all genetically identical. Uh, many cultivars are hybrids. Uh, here we've got two geranium species, and one of the many hybrids between them, which is usually sold as geranium claridge druce. Claridge druce, by the way, was an early 20th century pharmacist in Oxford, famous for his hangover cures. Now in the past, it was common to give these hybrid groups a species name with, with an X for, for, for hybrid, uh, but that's largely been dropped now. So when you see a genus name, and then in ordinary type and in inverted commas, um, another name, a non-Latin type name, um, that usually means that what we're dealing with is, is a hybrid between two species or more species. Hybrid, um, sorry, cultivars are selected for a great many reasons. Reasons of beauty, reasons of uh, functionality, reasons of hardiness, reasons of disease resistance, re reasons of being able to propagate more quickly and make more money out of it for the nursery many, many reasons for picking out uh, particular plants to propagate. So they're all ve vegetatively propagated, so they're all genetically identical as cultivars. Now, with sexual reproduction, production of plants from seeds, we've got a recombination of genes, and therefore there's going to be some level of genetic variation amongst the seedlings, which means there's going to be some unpredictability of outcome. Whereas when you are propagating non-sexually, vegetatively, through division or cuttings or graftings or micropropagation, the genes are all exactly the same as the parent and each other. So no genetic variation, so we have complete consistency and predictability. Uh, so really cultivars, strictly speaking, are propagated vegetatively. However, some seed strains have been going through so many generations of self-pollination that they are effectively more genetically identical. Uh, and an and and uh, example is the Palace Purple Select variety of, of Heuchera. However, if you were to sow pips of a favourite apple and wait a few years before they all start to flower and fruit, you will be very disappointed because probably hardly any of them will have anything like the juiciness or flavorness or size of the original. Uh, they'll probably be scrubby little things that um, perhaps fit only for making cider. So with a great many plants, cultivars, growing seed from cultivars will produce such a disparate range that they will be almost useless. Some cultivars have been around such a long time and get so easily muddled up uh, that the cultivar name is there's various things, in fact, covered under that cultivar name. We don't really know who the real King Alfred Daffodil is. 
but uh, anything that fits a certain set of criteria, however, is generally accepted. Now, some of these uh, scientific names, when they're added to horticultural cultural names, get pretty complicated. Subspecies, for example, are groups defined by botanists as having a distinctive character below the species level. So this ornamental grass, for example, should really be Malinia, Chirulia, subspecies, Arundinacea, transparent. And this is how it's reprinted, of course, in the Royal Horticulture Society Dictionary of Horticulture. However, let's face it, a lot of times it's just going to get called Malinia, Chirulia, transparent, or even just Malinia, transparent. Doesn't really matter, it just makes life a little bit easier. But cultivars ensure consistency and predictability which in many cases is what we want. Uh, vegetables, for example, fruit, uh, box hedging, trees in an avenue, we want them to be all the same, but not always. There are certain advantages of growing from seed and having variation. Broccoli, if you're a commercial grower of broccoli, you want all your broccoli at once. So it can be harvested and sent to market in one go. If you're an amateur grower, that's the last thing you want. You want your broccoli coming out over a nice long time, otherwise you're gonna be giving it all, away, all to the neighbors, all trying to shove it all in the freezer. Uh, the natural variation of seed grown plants means that that population can adapt to different, as different plants will have different abilities to survive in different soil conditions, different climates, or have resistance to different, type, different diseases. Um, but this is something that they can only play out over a long time, over at the, the scale of the population, over many, many generations. Um, and it doesn't really have very, very much impact on the garden level. Um, which means that uh, with the, the seed swap, which uh, can be a fun way to get seed, although to be honest, quality control I wouldn't trust, um, there's a belief in some quarters that if a vegetable seed, for example, is, is, is grown in a particular locality for a couple of generations, it will actually be better adapted to that place. Well, unfortunately not. Um, really, the, uh, you would need many, many generations within a pretty big population, the kind of thing that a commercial breeder uh, would, would, would be doing. Um, and it doesn't really work at the kind of level at which most of us are growing vegetables. So that's not something that, that really should have much uh, impact on your seed choices. However, uh, with ornamental plants, there can also be advantages to variation. Different colour, for example, like with this Thelictrum aquilegifolium, which I used to grow and would self-seed a bit at my old garden in Herefordshire. Generally purpley pink, some of them are definitely darker, like the one at the back, and the occasional one is pure white, like the one at the front. And that level of variation can be fun and attractive. Um, in the la at landscape level, of course, there are advantages to consistency, but there are also massive disadvantages, particularly with resistance to disease. With a clonal population, which is what a, a, a cultivar is, if one gets a disease, then the whole lot will. Dutch elm disease was the disaster it was in the British countryside in the 1970s because every plant of the English elm was actually a clone originally introduced by the Romans. So genetically identical, they all went down like nine pins. Which means we probably should be much less worried about ash dieback. The ash tree, Fraxinus excelsior, is a natural population, a seeding population, with quite a lot of genetic variation. There's a hardcore, a small percentage of trees that don't seem to have any effects on the disease whatsoever, uh, and another small number that get totally killed and everything in between gets certain other levels of, of infection and, and damage. But that does mean that there's enough genetic variation in the population that means over time the resistant uh, young seed, the young seedlings that are resistant will grow, will be selected for and will grow up to be healthy trees and the whole population will change and also foresters and the nursery industry will be able to propagate uh, seed from, from those plants. Um, so um, I will leave you with that thought and I hope I've been able to clarify some of these uh, issues about uh, plant names and, and cultivars and their advantages and disadvantages. So happy gardening and stay safe.